Well, we want to close out this last session with maybe an uncomfortable topic, and uh, and I don't know how exactly you'll use this, but I hope that it's helpful. Uh, the the theme is submission to leaders. Uh, the reality is is that submission is a Christian posture. Uh, submission is a posture that Christ Himself had in His own life here. Uh, we find that in Philippians as well as other places, right? I mean, Jesus had a posture of submission to God the Father. Well, this becomes a posture that we all need to take at some moment, at some level. And, and I would argue this, that our ability to submit or our posture in submission to those who are in authority over us is a reflection of our posture of submission to Jesus. So take this to a, a number of different spheres in life, right? The Bible calls us to submit to those who are in leadership over us in uh, the government. And so our willingness to submit to them is actually a reflection of our willingness and, and posture of submission to Jesus. This is true in the church as well. So in this particular session, I'm not actually going to speak to those of you who are in an authoritative position. I'm going to speak to those of you who are in a, po a position under the leadership of someone else which by the way is all of you. Um, but in that dynamic, I'm gonna speak from this perspective because we recognize a couple things about Christian submission. Number one, it's how Christ postured himself. Number two, uh, it is voluntary. Uh, Christian submission is one of those things that we volunteer ourselves to. It's never forced from the top down. Christ Christian submission is one of those things that we submit to. Now, there's some motivations for why we're willing to. Number one is this, is that we trust. Now, that trust is not always there when it comes to the person we're submitting to. And so if it's not there, we actually have to put that trust in God. Notice what's happening here. So the question comes, what if I don't trust my leaders? Should I submit to them? Well, the question then becomes, well, do I trust Jesus? Do I trust God? Here's the dynamic. Do I trust that God is big enough to hold them accountable? Do I trust that God is big enough to move in a way that causes repentance or change to take place? That I don't have to always be the instigator of that. Now, that doesn't mean that at times I'm not bringing healthy criticism or that there's not even an element of rebuke. We do see rebuke in 1 Timothy, but there's two kinds of rebuke. One is told to Timothy, don't rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. That word rebuke there is to strike at. But then later on in chapter 5, we're told that we can, as witnesses, multiple witnesses, bring a rebuke against our accusation against a leader and that they are to rebuke them publicly. That word rebuke there, not the same Greek word, but the word rebuke there is to say this was wrong. So there's a place, notice it's an individual Timothy. Timothy, this is not for you. Uh, that's not how you honor those who are over you. But there is an appropriate time for two or three witnesses to, to say this is wrong. This is an ongoing sin. And therefore, we need to bring this in front of everyone. So I want to bring up this question, this question of trust. What if I don't trust them? Do I trust him? Remember, this is Jesus's church. He's given far more than you will ever be able to give for the church. He cares far more for the church than you care about the church. He loves the church far deeper than you will ever love your church. And he sees a whole lot more clearly than you'll ever see the issues that are in play. If you have not yet said, Jesus, I trust you, I don't know that you're yet re ready to be the person who is ready to confront this. So I want to say that submission is a posture that is a Christian posture, posture and is a symbol of your submission to God. First Peter chapter 5, verses 4-7 through seven gets at this. Um, notice what it says in verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, this is in the context of elders and shepherds, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Notice the posture of submission to, the God, to, to God who has a mighty hand. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This text has much to say about this dynamic of submission. So if you find yourself in a church where you are living with those who are leaders over you, whether they be overs, elder seers, whether they be maybe a ministry team leader, a deacon who have authority or a leadership capacity over you in some way, we learn to submit to them. We, we learn to follow. Submission is voluntary.
Submission takes place, uh, this Greek word comes takes place in really kind of two ways. One is you place yourself under the authority of, or you place yourself under the protection of. I love that, that image. Um, one of the, the contexts for this word submission is someone who placed themselves behind a shield bearer. So the shield bearer goes out in front and protects them and they're submitting behind them. And both of these terms are in play. This is what we're to do to those who are overseers, to those who are elders in 1 Peter, is we're to place ourselves behind them so that they might protect us, so that they might uh, prevent the attack. And in that sense, we're also placing ourselves under their leadership, under their lead. So let's start with that. Let me uh, move on next to this. I also think we need to recognize the church, like the family, is the, the laboratory where we get to practice Christ-like behavior. Now, let me re-say that, because, because sometimes I think the, the, the healthy church is a church where everything is going perfectly, and no one is disagreeing with one another, and life just is bliss. We're all comfortable, we're all happy. That's really not the incubator of discipleship that God has put in front of us when it comes to the church family or the, the family. I've used my family in this series as a number of examples, and I'm, I'm a firm believer of this. God gave us marriage and family in part to teach us how much we're not like Jesus, and in part to teach us how much we need Jesus, and to be that laboratory where we practice being like Jesus when it's hard. We practice bearing with one another at times. We practice forgiving. We practice selflessness and looking out for the interests of others above ourselves. The church like the family, this household of God, is provided for you in part, not so that you can get everything that you want or that everyone can be happy or that everyone can, every, everyone can get what they want. The church is provided in part to teach you how selfish you are, uh, to teach you how to prioritize the needs of another person, uh, to teach you at some level how to forgive, how to be patient, long-suffering, to bear with one another. And so in this way, when I, when I talk about this theme of submitting to our leaders, one of the things I want to call, caution you against is to think that somehow the church should be exactly the way that you want it to be. No, the church is actually calling you to die to yourself. And so those who are leaders over you, their job is not to make you happy. One of the statements I had to adopt as a leader as I, as I led the church was, my job is not to make you happy, it's to help you to grow. Why did I have to adopt that? And honestly, I say it to my kids and they'll roll their eyes, I'm sure, someday at that as well. Because ultimately, I had to learn that my job as a leader can, can never stoop to the low level of just complaint management and making sure everyone's okay. If we see that dynamic, then Moses doesn't lead the people out of Egypt into the promised land. If we see that dynamic, Jesus doesn't lead his disciples into the garden and then to the cross. The comfortable style of leadership is not Christ-like style of leadership. And those who follow need to recognize that it's not the job of those who are overseers, leaders, to make everyone happy. They have to make family decisions. And so maybe the worship style isn't exactly the way you prefer. Maybe the best style of worship that you can give in a heart to Jesus is a heart where you worship him, even if the style isn't your preference, even if it's something you disdain and don't like at all. Why? Because Jesus is worth you giving your best, even if it's something that you don't get anything out of. Maybe the carpet color or the, the, program, or the programming or the style of preaching, or I don't know what it is. The new person they hired is not your preference. Maybe that's a great opportunity for you to learn to be like Jesus and trust him, even if you don't know that you trust those decisions or those particular uh, leaders that you have. So, I'm probably speaking a little bit, um, you know, to poke around, and I think that's intentional. I think that we should. The church is the laboratory where we get to practice Christ-likeness. Here's the next thing. Jesus is big enough to discipline those who are leaders. Uh, Christ is big enough to stand up for himself. I mean, you can read texts like Ezekiel. Read texts like Ezekiel chapter 34. Or read texts like Jeremiah chapter 23. In these texts, we hear the, the teaching of those who are shepherds, but they're shepherding out of selfish reasons. The flock is suffering, and, and those leaders are benefiting. And God is big enough to stand up in that moment. He gives them warning. 
Can you submit to your leaders in a way that trusts God and says, God, you're big enough and I know you see the dynamic that's playing out. Now, God doesn't always act as fast as we want him to, but we have this faith in him that says he can. Let me also challenge you to be humble. You may not know all of the issues and dynamics that are going on in the life of the leaders and the decisions that they have to make. Boy, if there's one thing that that ministry with a group of elders has taught me over the course of a decade of ministry is that I was completely unaware of the burden of responsibility that those who lead in the church carry. And the, the moment I walked away from a particular role of ministry, there was just this lightening of that burden. But that burden stayed with those who stayed in that leadership capacity. Be humble and recognize that those who lead over you carry a burden that you may be completely unaware of. And that honestly, like that word submission, that Greek word submission, they are protecting you from that. And there's been so many times in my life where I have seen that play out, where an issue comes up and I don't have to carry it home because there's a leader that I have placed myself in submission to, they have to carry that burden and I'm freed up from it. So celebrate that, find humility in that, recognize that you may not know everything and have the full perspective that is in place. I also want to say in the midst of that, um, we find some good examples of this. David, by the way, trusting God when it comes to King Saul and just saying, I'm not going to harm the king. We find God at times judging those who are not like this. We find those who are in rebellion against Moses being judged and even swallowed up. It's appropriate for us to respond in submission and humility when when God has placed a leader over us. So like in our last session, what happens when a leader's character is in question? Well, again, we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, and we recognize that we are to respond without partiality and without prejudgment, but we are to respond in a way that is just, that is fair, and preserves the witness and health of the church. In that particular case, we see two or three witnesses going and responding, and the church deals with it in a way that is healthy. Let me me close really our series with this. I see 1 Timothy, and oftentimes I've framed up 1 Timothy with this image. Let me kind of outline this for you. And it's it's kind of how the lens I see as I see 1 Timothy. The church is called to have this healthy teaching, this healthy doctrine as our foundation. And we've already said that the the elders, the overseers, this is their primary role, is to preserve this, to protect this, to teach this, this healthy doctrine. This becomes foundational to everything we do. Then we see these two themes. These become the two walls on this house. These two themes are godliness and good works. They are the healthy doctrine lived out in the world around us, in the community around us. This is how we interact. This is why we submit. This is why we serve. This is why we do all of the things we've been talking about this in, in this series, is because they live out this healthy doctrine, and this becomes, in many ways, a witness to the community around us. Why? Because ultimately, like that text we've been reading every time, it upholds truth. Truth becomes this witness to the community and the world around us. And we want to preserve this witness. We want to preserve the health of this church, this truth that we uphold. And we do that not only by how we teach, but how we live and interact in community together. So as I close out this series, I want to challenge you to spend some time in prayer as a group of leaders, to spend some time asking how can we not only preserve our witness, but also continue to push our witness forward in the community, to hold truth higher as a banner in our community by the way that we lead, the way that we serve, the way that we minister. Our prayers at Ozark Christian College are with you. We love serving the church. We love this partnership that we have. And so if there's any way that we can partner with you, better partner with you, I'd encourage you to get hold of me or get a hold of some of those who serve at the college uh, so that we can come alongside of you in this great task that we're called to do, which is to be a, a community, a body that represents who Christ is every single spot on planet Earth. 